My name is Chris Culpin and we are in uh, Castle Carey. People who come to Castle Carey sometimes wonder where the castle is. The answer is it's here on this site. On this site in the hundred years after the Norman Conquest were built two different castles and in this video I'm going to look at what they were like, uh, who built them, why they built them and where they are now. This is a tremendous naturally defensive site. To, in this direction, to the west and the south, the land drops away to the town of Castle Carey, the main street and the houses. And beyond that, following the valleys of the rivers Carey and Brew, you can see way down into central Somerset. And on this side, the land rises very sharply, uh, quite high to Lodge Hill, 300 feet. So this is a shelf above the town where the castles themselves were built. The story of the first castle at Castle Carey starts, as so many stories do in medieval England, at the Battle of Hastings, 14th of October, 1066. And you can see in this picture the Anglo-Saxons on foot with their shield wall, and on the left, the most powerful fighting force in Europe at the time, mounted, armed Norman knights. It was a long battle, lasted all day. Very unusual for medieval battles, which are often over in an hour or so. But in the end, the Norman knights persisted and the shield wall broke. And of course, Harold, their king, was killed with an arrow in his eye. And William was victorious. So what are his plans? William was intending to take over England, a remarkable thing to try and do. He had a tiny force. He had probably as many people as you could get in this quite small force of not many boats and with not many people on them. Maybe historians uh, argue about this, but maybe five, six, seven, at the most seven or 8,000 people. And this compares, for instance, with a thousand years earlier, the Roman Emperor Claudius had conquered England with 30,000 men, three legions. And he's intending to take over England with this tiny force. The population of England at that time was probably around one and three quarter million. One and a quarter million of them are Anglo-Saxons who had been here for 600 years. And the other half a million were people of uh, Danish and Scandinavian origin based around York in East England and had been here about 200 years. So this is uh, the extraordinary odds that he set himself. And though he was a determined, as we shall see, brutal uh, man who is going to make it happen. The key thing, two key things that he did, first was to make himself king. And you can see the difference in these two other extracts from the biotapestry. On the left, William a Duke of Normandy. A Duke is a military leader and not much more. On the right, uh, the coronation of Harold, Harold's coronation back in January. Key difference, of course, is the presence of Stigand the Archbishop on the right, standing next to the king. A coronation is a religious ceremony, and it meant that for William, and William was crowned just before Christmas, even though I can't show you a picture of that, uh, meant that a rebellion against him was not just a crime, it was a sin. But the other thing he did was much more practical, which was to order the removal of all Anglo-Saxon landowners from the lands which they held. And this is where at last we reach Kerry. Here we have the lands of Walter of Douai, who was one of these Norman knights. Well, actually, if you actually, those who know a bit of geography with northern France, it's actually, Douai's not in, in Normandy. Douai's actually in Flanders, uh, on what is now the Franco-Belgian border. And I was concerned about this for a while, actually, because Walter was not the only Flemish person who came over with William, uh, until I realised that actually William had married the daughter of the Count of, of Flanders. So they were his in-laws and his followers. Walter would have been a, uh, a knight. He would have owned enough land, not necessarily very much, perhaps a manor or two, enough so that he could uh, buy his very expensive chain mail armour and his weapons and his horses and to train. 
So not a not a not a great uh, landowner, but a um, a really powerful part of of, of uh, William's army. And he's given this huge amount of property in Somerset. Those of you who know Somerset will be able to have seen that really they're all crammed into the eastern end of the county between Wiltshire and Dorset and the Bristol Channel. And Carey was the biggest of these places. Biggest in population, probably around 250, 300 people. Biggest in wealth. It paid the highest amount of tax of any of those places. Certainly at this time, in the early medieval period, more important than Bridgewater or Wincanton. Why had William given Walter so much land cram, uh, in, in such a, a small area? Very unusual. William normally spread out his grants of lands to his followers over quite wide areas, scattered them around so that people um, spent their time travelling from one to the other and couldn't stir up trouble. But Somerset was special. Somerset was a dangerous place for William. It was the base of, the, of Harold's family, the Godwinsons. Harold, of course, was dead, but his brothers and his mother, the Countess Githa, were still alive, and William expected trouble. Uh, in the centre of Somerset, he gave the lands at Montacute, centred on Montacute, to Robert of Mortain, and another huge spread of, of manors in that area. And in the west, uh, William de Mohan, based on the castle at Dunster. So he's expecting in return for this uh, huge wealth that he's conferred on Walter of Douai. He's expecting service and an eye on these possibly rebellious Somerset people. So at some point in 1066-67, Walter walks into Castle Carey, Carey as it was called then. William could not afford to give him a, a big armed force, maybe three or four armed men, half a dozen. How is he going to control this area? Well, the Normans controlled England by building, wherever they wanted to make their base, castles that looked a bit like this. A uh, Motton Bailey Castle. This is a very simplified version, but it makes, makes the point I want to make, really. The Mott is that tower thing, a uh, sort of hill, handmade, a man-made man hill. There might be a wooden keep on the top. There's not much room at the top, but uh, uh, it was a lookout and safe. And then a bailey, which may or may not be as full as this one in this, in this picture, but would contain um, where the servants could live, the horses were kept, animals, supplies, and that too might be fortified. A Motton Bailey castle. And all over... England, particularly uh, on the borders you can see there, uh, Mott and Bailey castles were built, hundreds of them at this time. And maybe, maybe the castle that Walter built in Carey was a Mott and Bailey. He certainly built a Mott and Bailey here. He had lands as well as Carey, he had lands in Devon and around Bampton. And there is this rather fine Mott set in a, a, quite a large bailey which still, to this day, overlooks the town of Bampton. Is this, then, Walter of Douai's Mott? It certainly looks as though it could be. The land drops away to the south and to the west, and you can see, even from where this photograph is taken, you can see how a clear view can be seen westwards across to the heartlands of Somerset. But maybe the land has been piled up here to look as if it is a mot. It looks as like if it ought to be a mot, because uh, there's some doubt about whether this is actually uh, what was done. Is it perhaps a ringwork? Um, the best picture I can show you of a ringwork is this. That is to say, it's like a bailey without the mot, a sort of fortified, enclosed area. And one of the theories that's been put forward is actually there wasn't a mot at all. Um, they have found, when they were uh, building the houses in uh, Castle Rise, um, a very, very deep ditch, much further down the hill from the Mott. So maybe it was actually a ringwork that looked a little bit like this. Uh, that is to say, a, a, a deep, wide ditch and bank stretching right down almost to uh, what is now the horse pond. 
Events in Kerry are very much affected again and again by events on the national scene, so I need to just turn to that for a minute. William the Conqueror died in 1087, leaving four sons and a daughter, Ardella. Uh, Robert, his eldest son, wasn't particularly interested in becoming King of England, wanted to stay and inherit, become Duke of Normandy. So his second son, William, became King William II, William Rufus. He unfortunately died in a hunting accident in the year 1100, uh, shot while they were out hunting in the New Forest, and that stone commemorates uh, possibly the place. So uh, the throne then passed on. Richard, the third son, had already died. So it goes to the fourth son. And well, the fourth son expected to inherit the throne, but he did. Henry I. Uh, interestingly, the um, only one of the first six Norman kings, the first six kings after um, 1066, to be both born and buried in England. Uh, all the others were either born or buried somewhere else, probably in France, um, or both. And uh, they were, of course, French. We really are talking about Robert and Guillaume and Richard and so forth. Anyway, Henry I uh, began his reign in 11 and, had, and reigned for 35 years. He, he came to the throne uh, in his 30s and had a, a quite a long reign for the time. Meanwhile, in Kerry... Walter of Douai had died probably sometime in the 1090s. His son wanted to stay just with the Bampton lands in, in Devon. And so the lands then passed to the king, who gave them to a big Norman uh, landowner family, the Percivals. William de Percival was known as Lupus, the wolf. His son was therefore Lupellus, the little wolf. And gradually his Lupellus became Lovell. And it's the Lovell family who become lords of Kerry for the next 300 years. They were great builders, the Normans. We talk a lot about the great rebuilding of England in the 16th century, and obviously great building in England in the 17th, 18th, 19th and 20th centuries. But the Normans were great builders too. Enormous and wonderful cathedrals at Durham and Norwich, and parts still remaining in other cathedrals and monasteries too, and parish churches, this one here in Kent, almost exactly as the Normans left it some um, uh, 900 years ago. And they built castles, the, the White Tower, the Tower of London's Norman castle, the largest castle in Europe in its day, and they built other castles as well. These two can still be seen, Headingham and Rochester. You get the plan of a Norman castle. It's square, it's high, Particularly, it has a square floor plan. And sometime in the 1120s, Ralph Lovell built a stone castle in Carey on the same site of Walter of Douai's mot or earthwork or whatever it was. It was last really, and his only real excavation, was in 1890. Uh, John Francis made the plan, and here it is. Uh, and you can see, I'll come back to this plan again, but you can see that it gives us a rather rectangular looking castle. And it may be that for some reason or other, um, Ralph wanted a, a different shape for this castle. Maybe it fitted the land better. Maybe he felt it was high enough already and didn't need to be high. Now, it's not there, of course, but there is a rectangular castle still around. It's in Castle Rising in northwest Norfolk, and here it is. Uh, and it may, it may just give us a clue as to what the, um, uh, the castle at Carey might have been like. In fact, this person who electronically built an overview of what he thought the castle might look like. That curious shape that it sits in is as a result of, uh, of the mot at the bottom there. Gives a good idea this this electronic creation of the uh, the bailey there, and it's the space that you a fortified space that you need. Um, this is of course a big maybe, but this is what um, the Carey Castle might have looked like. What they've done is to take Castle Rising and drop it onto what might be the uh, the landscape at Carey. This is, you know, this is, I think, 
quite exciting reconstruction. Nevertheless, the person had little idea that the land dropped away to the left, to the west, uh, and rose enormously to the right. Anyway, it gives you an idea. Let's take an idea. If you want to know what living in this castle was like, let's have a look at what Castle Rising is like. You can see that it is, again, slightly rectangular. The ground floor was not possible to be entered from the outside. The ground floor is storage, cellars, maybe a dungeon. The only entrance you would see um, as you approach the castle is this. Probably um, this is shown open, but fortified then with um, uh, a portcullis, guards, doors, and leading only to a big staircase that leads you upstairs to the first room. So you arrive in the um, what's, what's marked here as a F, a sort of waiting room. The Lord of a Castle was not just a military lord. It's not just a, a military establishment. I think people think of castles with, with permanently with archers at the arrow slits and soldiers along the ramparts. But someone like Ralph Lovell was first and foremost a big landowner, a big landowner, a big landlord. So people would have to come to him in the great chamber, that's E there on the plan, to pay their rent. He also, because he was the lord of so many people, uh, had uh, legal power over them and held court, dealing with, well, petty things like whose sheep encroached on someone else's land and, and minor thefts and so on, but including um, the power of life and death over these, these people. So the manorial court. Most of all, though, um, a lord in his castle was a great social figure. Um, he is a key figure in East Somerset, and he would expect to entertain and uh, entertain his equals, but also to offer hospitality to whoever might be around. And there is the Great Hall, which you can see is occupying more than half the space in the castle. Uh, his throne niche is at one side, and he would sit at the high table with his social equals, while anyone else sat on other tables in the Great Hall. But to be seen and be seen was really important. Other buildings, of course, would need a kitchen, of course. Uh, there was a chapel, there must have been bedrooms, toilets, and, and so on. So it's, a, it's first and foremost a home. As regards military use, um, Castle Rising, who um, we're, we're really looking at here and wondering if Castle uh, Carey was the same, Castle Rising has never saw military action. It's still there 800 years later and never a shot fired in anger. Carey, as we shall see, was involved in two military actions. But even then, uh, it, it, it didn't last anything like 800 years, more like perhaps 40. But in the course of those 40 years, probably as little as um, 10 weeks were, would, would have seen this castle armed and bristling and involved in military conflict. The Victorians were mainly concerned to establish the dimensions of this castle, and that is really important. They marked each corner with these stones, which are still there, though some of them have been moved. And using the Victorian measurements and the stones that they put there, Castle Carey Castle was the fifth largest stone castle in England in its day, surpassed only by the Tower of London, Dover, Middleham and Colchester. So this is um, remarkably the fifth largest castle in England in its day, and there's almost nothing to see except these stones and a few bumps in the grass, and even the stones are probably no longer in the right place. Ralph Neville built his castle at a time of looming crisis in England. Let, let, let's see how, um, how that arose and how it affected events in, in Castle Carey. It starts in November 1120, when on the harbour side here at Barfleur in France, 
but a little um, port. King Henry I and his son, uh, 18-year-old son, Prince William, his son and heir, were waiting on the harbour side to catch a boat across to England where they expected to spend Christmas uh, in their castle at Clarendon. A big group of people, uh, lots of family, lots of uh, hangers-on and courtiers. The government of the country travelled with the king, so there would be clerks and uh, boxes of documents. As they were waiting on the quayside at uh, Barfleur, which is just here uh, on the uh, Cherbourg Peninsula, as they were waiting on the quayside, someone came up to the king and said that he was the son of the man who had provided the king's father, William the Conqueror, with the ships that he used to take his men across the channel back in September 1066. And that he now, said this man, had the fastest ship on the north coast of France, called the White Ship, and he'd love to take the king across to England in this. Henry thought for a moment and uh, just said, well, he, he was fixed up with his usual um, mariner. And though Prince William overheard this and was attracted by the idea of um, uh, the white ship, perhaps he's a, a Top Gear fan before his time, and said, why don't we have a race? You set off first, father, and we'll wait a while and then set off and see whether the white ship is indeed the fastest ship in the channel. So that's what they did. Henry set off. Uh, William and his friends hung around, maybe had a few glasses of uh, Calvados or something, waiting uh, a few hours, and then set off in their ship, almost as it was getting dark. It's November. And uh, the, the wind had dropped, and they were ab able to row. Uh, there were oars, and the white ship set off across the channel in almost darkness. And a mile and a half out from the channel, they hit a rock. The side of the ship stove in, water rushed in. Within minutes, the ship was sinking, and everyone, with the exception of one, one man, a local man, died, including the king's son. This is a disaster, uh, recalled as such by the uh, by a local a, a manuscript, a medieval manuscript, of, with a wrecked ship at the bottom and a grieving Henry at the top. But of course, it's not as if Henry had no heirs at all. Uh, there is always heirs if you look around a, a family tree, and this is what uh, the situation was really. Henry the uh, first and had a daughter, a perfectly legal daughter. Uh, married in wedlock, unlike the many sons and daughters he had out of wedlock, called Matilda. As you can see, his wife and his mother were also called Matilda, which must have made a bit of a problem. Now, Matilda, if you think um, life of a princess is, is a good one, bear in mind that in these days before ambassadors and diplomacy, relations between countries were carried out by the family. And Matilda had been married off as part of uh, Henry I's effort to, to get on good terms with the rest of Europe. She was betrothed at the age of seven to the uh, King of Germany, uh, married at 13 to this 19-year-old uh, bloke, and at 17 she became the Holy, he became the Holy Roman Emperor and she was therefore an empress and exercised power as an empress, elevated to, to one of the most powerful positions, certainly the most powerful woman in Europe for a while. Unfortunately, at the age of 23, her husband died and she was a widow. And she returned to England and was pretty soon married off to Geoffrey of Anjou. So she was therefore um, legitimate heir to the throne and, and Henry was very keen as he got older and clearly wasn't going to have any more children that everyone should uh, support her candidacy. No doubt the barons had some uh, thoughts about this. One, uh, she was a woman. Two, uh, she was married to uh, somebody else who no doubt would be assumed to take on the role and take all the decisions. And three, she was unknown to them. She'd been in Germany for all her teenage years and had grown up. And there was someone else. And you can see again on the family tree here on the right that to William the Conqueror's 
daughter, Ardila, had married Stephen, the Count of Blois, and had a son called Stephen. When Henry I died, eventually, in 1135, it was Stephen who rushed to London and took the throne. And mostly all those barons who had sworn allegiance to Matilda were happy about this situation. However, England was divided. And this gives you just a rough idea of how they split. The lands of Stephen are shown in red. And those who, who went for Matilda are shown in blue. I tried to, to look for why this might be. It, all I can think of is that Henry uh, had an illegitimate son who he'd made Duke of Gloucester, therefore Matilda's half-brother. Uh, and maybe there's a kind of West Country feel to Matilda's support. It was a long drawn out conflict between these two, a kind of civil war called by some historians, some historians of our earlier generations, an anarchy. A chronicler writing in the 1160s said this about this period. When the traitors understood that Stephen was a mild man and gentle and good and did not exact the full penalties of the law, they perpetrated every enormity. By day and night, they took those people they thought had any goods, men and women, put them in prison, tortured them to extort gold and silver. Some they hanged by the feet and smoked them with foul smoke, and some by the thumbs or by the head and hung coats of mail on their feet. This lasted 19 winters while Stephen was king. Then was corn dear and meat and cheese and butter for none was there in the land. Wretched men starved of hunger, and they said openly that Christ slept and his saints. Such things and more than we can say suffered we 19 winters for our sins. The trouble was that everyone had built, been building castles. Lots of castles had been built. Uh, the only way that you can uh, capture a castle, it, it, it's very, very difficult. It was therefore... Uh, the castle owners were able to hold out and war is, was therefore long drawn out with sieges and defences uh, and it was impossible really to reach any sort of conclusion, hence the 19 years. I know you're going to tell me there are these things. There's things like the uh, trebuchet on the left and siege towers on the right. Actually, neither of these had been invented um, by the time we're talking about in the 1130s and 1140s. It was almost impossible, therefore, to reach any sort of peaceable solution. Ralph Lovell's castle was besieged twice during this, uh, the Civil War, the Stephen and Matilda War, known as the Anarchy. The first was in 1138, when Stephen himself came here, moving very fast into the West Country via Bristol, and ended up besieging the castle at Carey. The Chronicle says that somewhere he had uh, machines which fired missiles of stones and fire. If he did, it's been suggested that this was the spot just within range of the castle behind me. But it wasn't the stones and the fire that brought Stephen victory. Ralph had been taken by surprise, he didn't have enough supplies, and he was eventually uh, starved out and surrendered and made a deal with Stephen that he wouldn't oppose him anymore. There was a second siege in 1153. This time, King Stephen sent one of his uh, strongmen, Henry de Tracy, down to besiege the castle. And Tracy built a small rampart at the top of the hill, which you can still see just rising above the, the rest of the grass, so that he could watch over the castle and make sure that no one came in or out. However, this time, the second Duke of Gloucester, one of Matilda's supporters, came drove off Henry de Tracy and handed the castle back to the Lovells again. After this war had gone on, dragged on, um, without any real conclusion between Stephen and Matilda, in 1153, some peace was made and a deal was made that Stephen should stay on the throne until he died, and after which his successor would be Matilda's young son, e easily the most able person who had emerged in these years, Henry. Uh, Stephen only lasted another year, and so in 1154, Henry came to the throne and turned out to be, as King Henry II, one of the most able, powerful, 
kings that uh, medieval England had, ruling eventually over land stretching from Hadrian's Wall to the Pyrenees, built up a system of justice, royal justice. Uh, and one of the things he did in order to make sure he, he maintained his power was to have many castles, these, these extra castles that had been built in the years beforehand, destroyed. And so one of those was Castle Carey. Uh, it was knocked down, probably the timbers were taken away, the roof taken off, and the villagers soon began to use the the stone as, as a form of quarry. And that's the view now as we look at it from uh, uh, from the top of the hill. 